Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today with you all for the launch of the Builders of Progress report. I will be your host for the event today. My name is Julie Simond, and I am the deputy editor of Are We Europe? We are an independent magazine that works with the next generation of journalists, photographers, and creatives to collect underreported stories from across the continent. Today, we're meeting at the headquarters of the Foundation of European Progressive Studies. FEPS is a think tank of the progressive political family at an EU level. Their mission focuses on the development of research, policy advice, training, and debates. All of this contributes to their goal of inspiring and informing socialist and social democratic politics across Europe. I'm first going to do a few bits of housekeeping before we get started. Um, there are copies of the Builders of Progress report all throughout this building, essentially. Uh, they are free to take home with you and peruse at your leisure, so please do take a copy with you um, later if you don't already have one. The first part of the event will be live streamed, uh, then everything will be happening in person here at the FEPS headquarters. I would encourage anyone listening from home who would like to join in person um, for the later sessions to please come and join. Um, for the first portion of the event, uh, please refrain from using this door over here. It has a big sign on it that says, please use the other door, um, follow suit. Uh, otherwise, you'll block the camera for the live stream, um, which won't be very fun. Uh, pictures will be taken throughout the day to be used on social media for your information. And if you're partial to posting on social media, the hashtag for the event is hashtag builders of progress. So please feel free to use that. Now it's time to get to it. We've got an exciting program ahead of us. We'll start with an introduction to the report, and it's kind of why we're all here today. We'll hear discussions centered around what it means to be young today and a keynote speech by Conor Rousseau. Then we'll obviously hear a lot more about the key findings of the report. We'll then divide later in the day after the live stream into breakout groups to discuss the key findings more closely and dive into the topics of political participation, equality, and climate and sustainability. You'll also hear more about concrete action and policies later in the day, and you'll have the opportunity to ask any questions that you might have. Now, I would like you to please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to FEPS' Secretary General, Laszlo Andor, who will be kicking off the event. Um, at a year ago, uh, to join the last to help coordinate this process um, after uh, having individual. When someone says this, um, that we as a system wanted to take this away. Uh, not without uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Is it better? Okay, look, um, the I start again. Um, the 2022 was announced already a year ago to be designated to the European Year of Youth. And once um, uh, such an announcement at the European Union level is made, uh, you have to take it seriously. Uh, I also have to add that this was not an entirely new idea. Some time ago, uh, this uh, proposal was floating around in the Brussels bubble. Nevertheless, the time has come in the post corona period uh, to focus better on uh, the young people. Why? Because this was another crisis when you could say, whether you are an analyst or an activist or a policymaker, that this has been another crisis when the young people were hit the hardest. And whether you are in the labor market or in education, uh, it's not been very easy 
uh, to be young at these uh, difficult uh, times. So uh, FEBS joined forces with um, uh, its members because uh, for us uh, political think tanks, uh, this is the normal way of operation to form an alliance. And an alliance has been very uh, strong um, and some of the representatives of the FEBS member foundations are also present here. The Annie Clava Morf uh, Foundation uh, from Switzerland, uh, Progressiva, Drustro Progressiva, the full name uh, from Slovenia, Fondacion Felipe Gonzalez, you can guess, uh, from Spain, uh, Fondacion Jean Jaurès uh, from France, the Party of European Socialists um, sitting in Brussels, and also you can see Think Young, uh, which um, provided much of uh, the work and the analysis which you can see in this thick uh, volume. I suggest you're not reading this during uh, the meeting because many of the discussions will uh, point to specific parts of uh, the content uh, anyhow. But before we jump into the first conversation, let me just highlight a few uh, points. Uh, the number one point is that in this post-corona situation, obviously the top issue of the survey had to be how the young people lived through the corona, what kind of uh, experience they had, and what conclusions they can draw from this. But uh, even if that's uh, uh, the case, and uh, the surveys that have been conducted at the end of last year and uh, the early months of 2022, uh, the questions went well beyond the corona uh, question. Uh, they also looked into what key policies are most important uh, for the use, how they look at the European Union, is it part of the problem, is it part of the solution, and um, especially in which areas uh, the young people would expect the European Union to do more or to do better or to do more effectively. And um, there will be lots of details about this in the discussion today. What uh, was for me very interesting that on the one hand, uh, the majority of the world. At the same time, uh, there is also a keen interest in a stronger social dimension. There's a lot of attention to issues like the minimum wage coordination or potentially a basic income or minimum income schemes which the EU is working on. So in the EU jargon, uh, you would say that the majority of the use is open to both deepening and enlarging uh, the European Union. But uh, it would be obviously foolish to stop with such uh, cliches instead of going into uh, discussing the real experience and to discuss um, uh, the real experience from the very start. Um, I would like to invite two young friends to two, from two different uh, countries of uh, the European Union. Uh, one of them would be Caridad, and the other one would be Panagiotis. Why don't you take your uh, seat here while I briefly introduce yourself. Uh, Caridad Alarcón Sanchez is from Spain, from an organization which is called Organizing Bureau of European School Students Unions, and she's a board member. And Panagiotis is from the European Youth Forum, where he's also a board member. Welcome to FEPS. Um, are you first time at FEPS? Um, okay, so many mics. Uh, hopefully they also were. Uh, so we started with the issue of the corona. So I, if you don't mind, I would ask both of you respectively, um, what is your summary of the corona experience from uh, where, live, where you lived through uh, these years? Um, I'm struggling with uh, me personally, and I know uh, most of the European students were also struggling with that. And um, we know that also because in Obesu we did this this research on mental health, and most of them they they said they were facing um, with isolation, depression, and mostly of the fear of not knowing what was going on, on their evaluation and the methodology they were uh, using for school, online classes, and most of them, they were just kind of wanting to know if someone was going to ask them what they needed 
for for a better education and to access to the, that education. So that's my summary. <laughs> Why did we turn to this? Oh, Cyrus. Well, I was living in Belgium. I'm, I'm permanently living in Belgium, but also thinking that the, the more of an expat perspective. Uh, during the pandemic, I think, as also thinking as a st uh, about to start my mandate in 2021, uh, already leaving the lockdown, etc. Uh, I was lucky enough in in sarcastic way to finish my working contract on March 15th, 2020, and entering the unemployment uh, two days before the lockdown. Uh, that was a very, very uh, stressful experience, and I'm quite sure that wasn't the only one. I couldn't enter back to the education uh, sector as a as a student, as a learner, because everybody were uh, getting into an unfamiliar phase, uh, lacking structures for students to be engaged and find a solution together, lacking structures uh, publicly for people to engage and know what is happening and how they can support. Uh, having the label that I am reactive and not uh, supportive as a young person to people in risk, thus all together coming, it, you get an internal stress because of unemployment, lack of uh, uh, acknowledgement of, of what are you doing while in your studies or post your studies because you don't know the future that is coming after a crisis like this. And on the other side, all the media, the, the misinformation, the... Uh, manipulation of uh, situations when it comes to us in the public sphere versus decision makers in the public sphere. Uh, there's a new government in uh, one of the member states uh, uh, with the Council of Europe, for example, thinking of the UK that uh, were running parties while the public media were talking about uh, young people not respecting restrictions, etc. So for me, the, the most part was not only the mental health impact from my inner circle, but also the per perception of my uh, age group or, or my people as, as if we are one group altogether, not diverse at all, and the responsibility that we had while we, we would volunteer, we would take into account things that we can still do as less in risk versus the people that they were really into uh, a, a greater amount of risk to the, the health, uh, which were also were part of our families, our grandparents, our parents. So this, this was much more complicated. And I'm very happy for, for you getting to reflect with this report. And I think data and evidence is always important because we tend to forget as people things that have happened, even if it's one year ago. You mentioned mental health. Uh, let me quote uh, a number from this survey because the survey actually says that about 60% of the young people in Europe are really concerned about the effect of the lockdown on mental health. So I wonder if you equally experienced uh, such uh, uh, tendencies. And um, on the other hand, whether you see something positive coming out of the you know, corona experience, how communities have been forced to innovate, or you know, communities coming together. So maybe you can elaborate on both sides of uh, the challenges. OK. Um, so for the for the mental health um, experience or for the issues that were happening on mental health, uh, me myself personally, I I struggle with the with mental health issues during the lockdown and after the lockdown, mostly after because I think during the lockdown most of um, most of the people, not young, not only young people, but all of the the population in the world um, had the time to. For the first time in so many time, we had the time to think and to sit down and actually stop what we were doing. So that time in a psychological way, uh, your brain stops and then the anxiety comes, the, the thinking, the overthinking. And that's the moment when you realize that you were just struggling with anxiety your whole life, but you didn't know because you didn't have the time to stop and just sit for a minute. And to think and to and then you got bored also of your phone because we were all the time with the phone with the computer and you got just tired of that so you just were we with yourself and after the lockdown then coming back to that life it was even harder for me it was it was very very awful to go back to my to my to my life to high school to see my friends I was like who is these people I only saw them on a screen and now they are real 
how do I face this uh, <laughs> social interaction again? I, I needed to rebuild what I was, um, what I learned <laughs> a few months. And, and I think I was lucky enough to also have the access to mental health services because most of my peers, they didn't have that. Most of the countries, they have uh, private psychologists, uh, private therapists, but not, not everyone can access that. And we need to guarantee um, first uh, education on mental health, and then we need to um, give them the access to, to mental health uh, services for everyone, um, no matter um, their, their background or the money they have. It, it's, it's something that we all need, and that should be... Very important lesson. Uh, taking over from that, as Youth Forum, we also did a report last year and we presented about the uh, scars of the pandemic on young people. And one of the key elements we saw was mental health. Uh, personally, I have ADHD. So uh, for the people that know me, I tend to speak a lot. But I have a, a certain pace in how I speak. After one or two months from the pandemic and the lockdown, the moment that the phone would ring, I would answer and I was like on a timer, go. And I would speak fast. And my friends were like thinking that, okay, maybe he's in a rush or something. But after a week or two, a friend of mine told me like, Pete, you just sent their phone, calm down. I'm not going to hang up. And that's the moment because I lived alone. I realized that I'm, I'm, I'm literally anxious while at that time, I was okay. I, I just um, dealt with the, the administrative parts. But only think about it, I get shivers because the issue with mental health is that even in circumstances of calm, your brain is on a safe mode. It chooses to protect you from any crisis, even a crisis of yourself. So one of the good lessons we had during the pandemic was understanding mental health and the stigma that it has. And I think we passed at the level, and yesterday uh, celebrating, so uh, reminding ourselves the mental health uh, in a word scale, the most important thing is about accessibility, is about understanding the level of self-awareness that needs to be uh, supported, and then infrastructure. Universities have counseling offices. How many of you could access those counseling offices during and after the pandemic at the quality level. I'm, I'm quite sure that most of you don't even know if your university has a counseling office for mental health services or not. And that's the reality we have. And we should make sure that our infrastructures are not getting better after we face problems. We need to make sure that we invest and engage with people that they're quality no matter what. Thank you. Now we go from crisis to crisis. Why? Because when we had the Corona uh, lockdowns, we saw that we have this period with uh, a pandemic, and then there will be mass vaccination, there will be herd immunity, and then we will live happily ever after. This is not the case, right? Now, since the invasion of Ukraine, there is another major uh, crisis in Europe. It's about security, it's about energy, it's about many other things. Maybe you could say a few words um, about the impact of this on the thinking or the situation of the young people. Let's make a switch. switch. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm quite aware that the we also what happened yesterday uh, in Ukraine, um, and I, I whoever wishes uh, or or sees it online, I, I hope that at least people there uh, are strong enough to overcome the stupidity of. Uh, the Russian uh, leader. But overall, I think for us, young, old, or whatever, I think the impact is personal. As a Cypriot, uh, with a country that has strong relations with Russia, unfortunately, uh, it's weird to see an external factor in such an aggressive level defining my life. What I'm worried, and I'm, I'm very, very... Um, um, strong in my opinions when it comes to Zelensky and, and the work he does, but both governments have an impact to their people. The decision of a young person at their time of, of transitioning from education to, to, to life and work, if they need to protect their family or their country, if they're anti-war, if uh, they're in the mental status to participate uh, in uh, military operations, 
if they can flee their country or not at the level they are disabled, uh, trans people, um, uh, people at the 17 or 19, which are were caught up in this transitioning level. There's so many questions at that level of a personal impact when it comes to conflict. But on the other side, what I see the unity that we have as, as, as a region in the world, at least, is that we do understand, unfortunately, this was not the first war in Europe since the Second World War. And that is something that I was very disappointed to hear European countries saying, because we have a very bad history when it comes to Europe, uh, Europe uh, wars in Europe and wars caused by Europe. But in the other sense, the, the, the scale of impact that we saw financially, as we are now, made us realize that solidarity is the, is the way forward. Cooperation is the way forward. And I'm very happy as well with the, the political, uh, how's it called? Uh, European policy something? Community. Community, that one. Community, thank you. Community. Uh, it's, it shows as well that there is beyond the financial aspects. There is beyond the, the commercial aspects, which I think that as well can bring an aspect if we truly focus on the cooperation and solidarity to build this European community that we really need to avoid this type of conflicts, to answer to crises which are really impacting human life and not interest of expansion of uh, borders and, and other interests. And, and I hope that this guy gets to wake up and understand that uh, the time is, is, is over. We're talking about human lives. So continuing with uh, with what you were saying about the the human lives, and I think um, I'm talking from the generation set from the 2000s, and uh, me myself from 2003. Uh, we realized how fragile the world can be, and that we were just surrounded by this information and this collapse of social media, uh, telling us one thing and then another thing about uh, this government and these other governments, and like the war was everywhere and everyone was talking about it and everyone was just in this also depressed mode of how fragile the world can be and i i have friends whose parents were in 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 ukraine and they had to to leave the house and i think um also from the educational perspective we have so little knowledge about these things and how wars can affect um the system and how wars can affect uh, in a political way and mostly in a in a human way because sometimes we see in the news that they talk about numbers they talk about finances they talk about refugees as just a word but we tend to forget that we are talking about real people a real impact um one person that dies is a person with a life with a background with a family and Talking in about like dehumanizing these things is is also very sad for a generation that sees all these things in the news and they just pick sides. If they, I pick this side, who are you with? Ukraine, Russia? No, we're talking about human lives. We're talking about a human impact, and we also need to educate people to see that, and to inform them, and also to to give them the access of education. We also saw that with um, with all these uh, young refugees, student refugees that came to the all the European countries and they didn't have the the access to our quality education. They We didn't have the funding for supporting this transition. They they came from a war and we put them in, on a classroom and we, taught, and we tell, told them just to sit down and listen to the lesson in another language, but what was going on? They needed the support to transition from, from leaving their families, from leaving their parents, from leaving the life they knew. And we, we, need, we needed this uh, funding and this um, access to this quality, the infrastructure, and to really realize uh, that uh, we don't need to dehumanize, we need to humanize the, the world again and not make this... Uh, don't stay in this depressed uh, mode all the time because it's really fragile what we have now. Thank you so much. You highlighted uh, some of the most important lessons and I'm glad you also mentioned the refugees because I think it's very, very important to maintain maximum solidarity with those who had to leave their country, but also those who stayed and continue to fight. And uh, we also need to bear in mind that um, indeed the period of reconstruction is going to be very demanding uh, one, this unity of the European 
uh, continue. Uh, thanks for your thoughts, uh, 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 both of you, Caridad and Pete. And now we should uh, hand back uh, the microphone and uh, um, uh, prepare the stage for the keynote speech. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you for that compelling and uh, frankly quite relatable uh, sharing of your experiences. In a second, I will be inviting Connor Russo to come up to give the keynote speech. Uh, politically conscious and active from a young age and having studied law at university, Connor quickly became the youngest Belgian party chairman at the age of 26. He has now been the chairman of the Social Democrat Flemish Verhut party since 2019. Welcome, Connor. Please give him a warm welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you understand me clearly? The back, okay. I want to um, say sorry uh, in advance for my poor English because I had a, a few hours of sleep this night. We are uh, we are in Belgium budget negotiations, and we just had an agreement. Um, so it's been a, a very uh, very busy weekend and a very busy night. But um, what I'm going to tell you <clears throat> today is where um, where I come from. So how did I manage to become president of our party at such a young age? And what I think are a few elements of success, because we're doing very well in polls, but it's just polls. It's not real elections, so did not uh, already win. Eh? But it's uh, it's a sign that that uh, social democrats can, can win and can rise in, in polls as well. So um, I was uh, uh, a an assistant of the former president of our party. And so uh, I always always say in Dutch that I was his bitch. Um, in, I mean it in a good way, so not in a sexual way. <laughs> um, that I started by uh, making coffee and going like everywhere he was, I was there because I wanted to learn real fast. And uh, from uh, making coffee, uh, I said, yeah, I'm studying law so I can do more than, than uh, preparing coffee. And he, he gave me a lot of opportunities to show myself. So I worked really hard and then I became, his, um, I became responsible for his social media. He did not have any social media in the year 2015. So I, I, uh, I made his Facebook account, his Twitter, and then I became his um, head of communications and his spokesperson. I became his... Um, uh, member of parliament in 2019 and um, the day after that the, my colleagues uh, voted me as uh, their group leader I think you say in, in, in English group leader or leader of the group in parliament and six months after that I was uh, president of the party so I was working four years as an assistant and after those four years we really lost elections but really lost uh, our uh, historic lowest point ever. Um, and so I wrote a little note, uh, was not to publish or something, but note to myself. And it was, uh, the title was how not to win elections. My four years working for SPA, now it's Forat, forward in English, um, my four years uh, with uh, SPA. And I've learned a lot of things how to do, but I saw a lot of things how not to do. First of all, um, no, I'll explain why I, I am, I'm saying this. The first day I was elected as um, leader of the team, leader of the group in parliament, the mayor of Ghent, I think you all know the beautiful city of Ghent, and if you don't know, you should visit it. Uh, the beautiful city of Ghent, he invited me because he did not know me well, and he said, okay, the youngest uh, person in parliament for us in a while. Um, and he wrote something, how not to win an election, let's come and, and, and ask him something. So I, I got the opportunity to speak in front of like 50 people in Ghent. And I was really um, talking a lot of hate about my own party. Hate is not the, the good word, but I really have a, had a love and hate affair with, with the party because I think that socialists, in, in Flanders we say socialists, but I think it's the same word as social democrats in the rest of Europe. Um, 
we really have a role to play these days. And so I love our ideology, but I hate the fact that the left is a lot of losing elections and that we don't learn from our own mistakes time after time was the case in Belgium. We lost elections for over 22 years in a row. And we kept doing the same thing, hoping that the outcome would be different. We kept doing the same thing over and over again. And so the first thing, it's a no brainer for smart people as you, but the first thing was um, don't fight each other in public. Shut your mouth in public when it's about internal affairs. So we've had, um, it was one of the worst nights, I, I guess, for, for our party. We've had uh, members of parliament debating against each other on national television from our party. There were four people in a panel, uh, a journalist, a professor. Yeah, you're smiling, but I, it, it was like that. A journalist, a professor, and two people of our party. Two people of our party had a different point of view, a different opinion. And the atmosphere in our party was so bad that no one could convince them that it was not a good idea to have the internal debate on public television with like 400, 500,000 spectators. I think everyone here would advise them not to do. We did advise them not to do, but they did. Second of all was we had a lot of um, provinces, provinces um, districts, and they all were their own boss, their own princes. So in new ages, in new, com new times of digital communication, there are no borders in ideology. There are no borders in um, framing. There are no borders in how people see you. But they were not that smart because our color is red. In Belgium, the color of the Social Democrats is red. I think that it's the same color in, in the rest of Europe. But at least you can discuss about that, with which color you want to go and campaign. And we did. Oh, we did had a lot of discussion about that. But we did not agree. So, and I'm not joking, but that was the state of our party three years ago. The elections of 2019, every district, we have five districts in Flanders, had its own color. So the one uh, district had pink. My district had red and white. District next to us had white and red. The other district had purple. And so we made a lot of ad uh, advertisements on social media. They were all started with the same name, SPA, Social Democrats. But people saw other artwork, other designs, other people, other messages. They could not tell what is that. So they turned away. And it's not only bad Facebook advertisements, but it was, um, it showed how internally divided we were. And so I can tell you a lot of bad things <laughs> of the four years I worked there. I will stop with that. And I'll, I'll try to explain what I tried to turn around. So I was a candidate for the, for uh, the presidency in our party, more as a, a sin, a signal, more as a, um, uh, yeah, to show that um, there were also young.
I will have make no compromises on one, two, three. And so I thought, okay, but am I really president now of a party? I, I did not understand how, how it could go that fast. And so I said, okay, it's now or never. So I wrote a text, the act of uniformity, the, uh, the pact of uniformity. Now we're, uh, we're writing uh, the act of uniformity. But the pact of uniformity was that there are rules for everyone and they're the same in every district. Most of you will say, okay, is that your big uh, invention you did? Yeah, but it was very hard to do that because we had to fire a lot of people who were not going to cooperate with that idea. And so as a young president who had no experience, I wouldn't be able to do it all alone. So I wrote a text with the help of some other people who made suggestions. And I went to our board, the board of our party, like the... 20 most important people who can vote for or against. And I told them, this is my text. You have 15 minutes to read it. And then you have to vote yes. And if even one person says no, I will resign as a president of the party immediately. And I was, and they knew me a little bit, not too good, but they knew I was serious. Because I was something, I have nothing to lose. I'm now president of the party. I was leader of the group. The, that already was good for me. So, And they did. It was really 15 minutes of stress. But they did. They did all vote yes because they were afraid. The party would really collapse and, and go into chaos when I would resign. And so now I, yeah, I have them, it's not, not, not polite to say like that, but I have them by, them by their balls because when they're trying to say, no, we're not going to do that, I say, you voted yes three years ago. So we're going to do that. And that was very important. We changed the way we were organized. We centralized power. And so um, it's not only me who is, who is, uh, who is um, deciding stuff, but it's very important that when we make a decision, there's, everyone can talk about everything they want but behind closed doors. And if we make a decision, everyone from the coast side till, uh, to Brussels, they will follow that decision. And I promised our members that I will really be very strict and will sanction people who do not follow what we've decided. I've already done that. And so people can trust then when they can, they can, they have free speech, they can say whatever they want inside. Whenever they go outside, they will be punished. That was very clear. Second of all, centralizing power was an advantage in the way we communicate, in the way we show ourselves, in the way we were uh, perceived at social media. We were the smallest party of Flanders at social media. But now after three years, me, myself, I'm the biggest person on social media in Belgium. We have a low budget for social media because we lost elections. So we have low, we lowered uh, the budget uh, in everything, but we had to be authentic and we change the narrative in being offensive. And if there's one uh, advice I can give you, uh, if you want to take advice from me is be offensive because what the problem was with us is that after 20 years of and it's really changing the mind. I'm still trying to change that mind, still in the Flemish parliament, where we had a, a big debate on um, budget spending, about childcare, about education. And the older generation of uh, parliament members, they're really still afraid of debating because they were, they, they were punched in the face so many times in debates the last 20 years. They're afraid of explaining what we're for or what we're against. And so we are introduced with, together with me, there are a lot of new members of parliament, younger people or new people, because new is not always about age. It's about people who are fresh in politics. And we're not afraid because we did not have anything to lose. We were already at our lowest point ever. So could it go worse? Maybe. Could it become better? We believe. And so being offensive. What they, tell, what they told us every, uh, every week in Parliament, we were told, 
yeah, you're socialist, you're for open, open borders. And then our answer was, strong answer, no, we're not for open borders. Oh, that was strong and convincing. And, and we convinced a lot of people with that. We taught ourselves something about framing. I went to Washington. I went to Stockholm. I went to London. I went to everywhere I could go to learn about framing. The best podcast you will you ever have to listen to is FrameLab by Lakoff. He's the best professor in the whole world about neuro uh, science. He's a neuroscientist. He talks about how we communicate and how other people perceive our message in their brains. Because communication is science. With Kahneman, who explains us that no fact, no number convinces no one. Only emotions and the story and hope can convince people. But at my party, they're still convinced, a few of them, that no, you should have your, your numbers straight. Yeah, if when you're in policy, you should do the right thing and you should explain your policy with good numbers, but you will never convince someone's mind with numbers. So I really trained and they can, they can, uh, they can confirm, thank you. They can confirm that. I really train every day, every week. I tell them, how do you explain that to my grandmother? How do you explain that to my little sister? That's the only thing you need to do in communication. People need to understand us. And that was a problem of the left in Belgium and is still the problem of with some left people. They want to try, they want to try so hard to show other people they smart. They smarter as all the rest. We're better. We are better, but to convince people we're better, they need to understand us. And so that was really a problem. And so we're, we, were, we learned a lot of framing about social media. And now I can say we're, they're talking about our frames. And that's what I think my, the, so I'm not really reading my speech here, um, but the person who wrote my speech still said when we're talking about um, frame what frame is working for us it's a social economic frame and they wrote here what um, the old-fashioned socio-economic frame so i don't like when i know you you haven't uh you haven't um right it but it's not old-fashioned because everything is socioeconomic. Climate change. Energy prices. It's the only thing, and I walk a lot uh, through Belgium, it's the only thing people ask me. What are you going to do about my gas bill? What are you going to do about my, my electricity bill? I can't afford anything anymore. And so climate change is also socioeconomic. The green parties or the four right parties who are climate negotiationists, uh, they ignore climate change. Yeah. They want to be, they wanted to have it about that from a climate frame, but it's socioeconomic. One example poor people live in poor houses. In poor houses, they need more electricity, they need more gas to keep the warmth inside. So when you need more gas, you pay more. There's also more emission. So the socioeconomic situation of a person defines their bill and defines their pollution for climate. So if we can talk about climate change in a socioeconomic frame, then we're talking about isolation of houses. We're talking about lowering bills, electricity bills, energy bills. And then we're talking, then we're talking business. Then we're talking about frames where people are actually talking about today. Because don't get me wrong, climate change is too important to let green parties organize it. Eh? It's so important that social democrats should organize it. But in a way that even my little sister and even my grandmother 
understand why we need to invest in collective measures from a strong government who ensure everyone they'll still be able to pay their bills after those investments. And so that's something that helped us a lot. But also about the headscarves. You know what I, what I mean when it's about the headscarves? In Belgium, there are a lot of parties who, who like the identity debate. What is it to be a good Belgian? What are our, um, our standards, our, our, our values? And that's an interesting debate for philosophers or professors, but it's not a debate that average people, average working class people are having every day where they can't afford they, to pay their rent or to pay uh, school for their kids. That's not the debate you're having then. But when they're in a socioeconomic bad situation, they're afraid. Afraid of their own future and afraid of the future for their children. But when you're afraid, yeah, you're very vulnerable, vulnerable for other messages that can make you even more afraid, like other people coming to your country. Other people where you have to share your prosperity with or to share your welfare state with. And we can make that work. We can make migration and immigration work if we put it under a social economic frame. Like today, there have never been so much open vacancies in Belgium ever before. So 213,000 jobs do not find a person to fill in the job. And so we can hate as much as we want about migration, but we won't be able to fund our pensions if we don't let some people come to our country to contribute. Now, I'm well aware that that's the issue. Do they contribute? But then we should make sure or, or ensure as a strong government, and I hope we all believe in a strong government here, that people with another color, another religion or another surname they're not discriminated because of that color or surname when they try to find a job. So I think in the socioeconomic way, if we say if we want to pay for our welfare state, if we want to make sure and to strengthen our welfare state, and I think welfare state is all for us, then we need more people to go to work and we need to find more people to fill in those open vacancies. Another thing about the headscarf I was talking to, there was someone in government, not uh, Secretary of State, but someone the government appointed to solve a problem because there were there were not enough politicians in Belgium to solve it themselves. So they appointed someone else to solve a problem. And uh, a young lady with a lot of potential, smart lady, she wore a headscarf. And there were a lot of um, opinions, a lot of trouble in government because some party said she's not neutral. She can't do a good job with that headscarf. And so normally in our party, there would be like a, a discussion between a separation of state and religion. Um, what is a good neutral uh, functionary? How, how, how are we going to do this? And I was like, oh, cut the crap. We're not going to open that box of Pandora again. We're going to just pull it to the socioeconomic frame. Like I said, I don't mind that someone with a headscarf is working here, paying taxes and helping to fund our pensions, I would rather have that every woman with a headscarf was working in our country. So everyone who can work, go to work. And okay, so it, was all, it was all, end of discussion. In all newspapers, there was just that quote of me and a lot of our members were saying, like, yeah, if, if you look at it like that way, yeah, we, we will need everyone to. So it's what we, we're master, we're, we're master of our own communication. So it's very important. And I guess for also younger people to be offensive, to let yourself um, space for mistakes. Because I made a lot of, I make a lot of mistakes, I guess, every day, but you can learn from that. And to Try as much, I think, for us in Belgium, but I don't know every situation, but for us in Belgium, the socioeconomic frame is working. Education is about socioeconomic emancipation. Uh, uh, Childcare 
is about learning a language, learning uh, to develop your talents. Um, everything in life from public transport is how can we um, lower the impact on climate change? How can we provide more uh, uh, public um, services in a good way to our, to our country? So that's what I did. A lot of new things. So new uh, frame, new narrative, new frame of, uh, of communication. We had a new name. So we were SPA, then we were Vorat. I first changed um, everything in from internal organization. And after that, I changed the name. Because if you first change a name, it's like, oh, they think that a new name on the in the same box would will make another box. It's the same box. But I think our 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 the, the transformation of name of a new name helped us and was not perceived in that way by the press. We had the we had a um, a good help for our uh, um, for our new name because um, um, a theater uh, in Ghent, a very famous theater, had the same name. Uh, so they were they went to court against me us because we stole their name. Um, but they lost, so we won. It's our name now, and uh, so every it was every weekend press in Belgium that the theater was the first time in in, in history that the theater was um, was going to court against a, a political party. But they forgot that it were our ancestors who built the fucking theater. So it was a socialist theater in the nineteenth century. So I just thought back to basics means give us our name back, and so we won. Um, New name, new building. We we moved to a new building, a very a new startup feeling where we uh, reorganize everything. We are real flexible. We have a gym. We have um, a chill area uh, where they can play PlayStation, but they're, they're too lazy to buy the PlayStation because there's a budget, but they still not have uh, uh, bought the PlayStation. But I want people to work hard, but also to enjoy being at their desk, being at their headquarters, it, it needs to be a nice, uh, atm there needs to be a ni atm nice atmosphere there. And what helped was, and that then I will end my keynote speech because I think I'm already over time. Yeah, you're looking, okay. You're not looking very enthusiastic, uh, I'm, I'm talking, so I'll keep it very short, is that um, what helped us was a new government. And so we, uh, we negotiated, um, one, one and a half year for a new government, but we did finish it uh, very good. We raised pensions. We raised minimum wages. We raised a lot, an, an historical amount of money, new investments in public health. In a time of pandemic about, um, and public health, mental health is a real issue, we not doubled, not tripled, but we multiplied the budget for mental health by 10. They would do everything perfect, no, of course not. But with even losing the, the last elections, we managed to put our price that high to step in a new government. They really needed us as a family, socialist family in Belgium, that we really delivered something. And so... Today, as well, we're going to deliver a new package um, in our budget negotiation. We will um, give uh, every, everyone uh, in Belgium 200 euros a month for their energy, energy bills, to pay their energy bills. We will um, lower uh, tax rates on uh, gas and electricity. We will um, uh, keep investing in higher pensions. We have an indexation of the, the incomes. I don't know if you know the... Yeah, you know it. So every time there's like, um, what? When the bucket of price, we have a bucket of prices, and when all the prices are are rising from um, as a, um, an effect of inflation, when the bucket is full, then we uh, raise all incomes with two percent. You don't have to do anything about it. No negotiation. It's automatically, and so now because inflation was 10% or 11%, wages, pensions, and incomes, thanks to socialists and social democrats in Belgium, are raised in Belgium with 10 to 12%. And so we really 
and they're still complaining that it's not a, that's not good enough. But we're the country in Europe where we protected the um, uh, purchase power of people the best. And so I'm, yeah, I'm glad to say that we were part of that, and that um, we are still very offensive, but constructive. We are still very left, but pragmatic, and we're still um, young. We're we know we still have a lot of experience, but also with a new with a lot of new young people. And so, when I started, we had eight point four percent in the polls. We were the sixth out of seven parties. Today, we have sixteen point eight percent in polls, and we're the third uh, party. So it's not enough, but sixteen point eight is the best result we've had in the last fifteen years. So it's just a poll. Yeah. Uh, be lower next time but we're really in three years we're we're growing and the last thing i want to say the real last thing is we're not fighting um against each other we're not fighting against against centrist parties we're really fighting against the far right because in flanders the conservatives and the far right they do have a potential majority in the, in the next elections we believe the polls, the last polls, all of the last polls, they show a majority for the conservatives and the far right. And I t- I'll tell my generation that after Sweden, after Italy, I do not want to be responsible in this country for a part of government for my generation. I'm the youngest uh, chairman of a, of a party, I think, in, in whole Europe, but especially in, in, in Belgium. I don't want to be responsible to have to see the far right in government in Belgium. And so if we can focus on keep our message simple and short and understandable for grandparents, for young children, for average working class people, they need us the most, but they don't trust us the most yet and so i think that's our real challenge to um to help each other on european level to help each other um wherever we can as uh, social democrats and to together to fight the far right to um to strengthen our welfare state thank you very much and i hope it was a little bit understandable thank you Thank you very much for that keynote speech, Connor. We very much appreciate it. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, Matteo Dressler, who is a policy analyst at FEPS, and Ilaria Niljes, who is a researcher at Think Young, to come and present the findings of the Builders of Progress report. Can you hear us? Yes, perfect. Now it's better, yes, okay. All right, um, yes, uh, very grateful to have you all here and to pre- present to you the, the results of our study. And starting off, I would like to talk um, a little bit about the project overview and especially the background a bit, the scope, the content, why did we look at it? So what we have here in the report, which you have seen floating around all around the house, is really one of the largest researches on uh, young people's political opinions in Europe. Why do I say largest? Because we um, surveyed 19,000 people in two survey waves. First survey wave was in the end of 2021, so in December, where we um, particularly asked about the background of the um, pandemic, how people were feeling, their main concerns, but also what we were thinking about the EU, uh, European Union should be doing about it. Second survey in April 2022 was asked about uh, against the background of the crisis in Ukraine, Russia's invasion there, especially trying to figure out what young people were concerned about in this conflict, but also if they would be supportive of the policies and the support given to uh, Ukrainian people. The survey was launched in uh, 12 um countries, 10 member states, and two non-EU member states, namely the UK and Switzerland. 
but it was not only a numerical exercise. So we also conducted focus group uh, interviews in um, four countries, eight focus group with 64 participants to also contextualize some of the uh, numerical findings we had. And whom did we ask? Um, people between 16 and 38. Why that age group? Sounds a bit random. It's the two generations which we were particularly interested in, which is Generation Z with the birth dates of 1997 to roughly 2012, and the Millennials with the birth dates of 1981 to roughly uh, 1996. And um, one of the main findings which came out early in the survey is that young people really want to be more engaged, more empowered, which also led us to choose the title Builders of Progress, Europe's Next Gen, because that is also something which is coming from the, the survey results. Um, and this is also how we will structure our presentation today and also how the report is structured. We are uh, presenting it in six building blocks, which are really the building blocks to building and co-shaping a progressive future. And the first one we're going to discuss is yeah, how young people thought about the COVID pandemic, um, how they felt within it. The second one, a block of questions, is about political participation, democracy. A third one is about equality, both the social economic dimension of it, but also uh, with a specific focus on, on gender, inequ uh, gender inequalities and uh, equality. The next one is about sustainability. Um, then we also talk about Europe and the world. So what do young people think about the EU as a global actor? And we finish on talking about more concretely about what young people want to see uh, in terms of policy uh, in the future and where they want the European Union um, to go towards to. So as Matteo said, the first the building block is the title of the COVID-19 experience and the new normal. As we also already heard uh, this morning and uh, as our finding also uh, showed up, uh, the pandemic definitely had uh, a strong impact on uh, young people's lives and we asked them uh, what worries them the most and we divided it uh, in uh, social concerns uh, as well as uh, personal concerns. As we can see in this uh, slide, the first uh, social concern was jobs and the future employment, followed then by poverty and inequality and physical health and well-being in society. However, when we move to the top personal concerns, we see that emotional and psychological well-being was actually the first uh, um, concern, followed by physical health and well-being. And then as, uh, in the third position, we have income. Since uh, uh, we found interesting that emotional and psychological well-being was the first personal concern, we followed up. And we found out that 61% of our respondents were actually worried about their uh, mental health. However, when we asked them how they coped with, with the pandemic during the lockdowns, we found out that only 10% of our respondents actually went to um, speak with health professionals, which is a low number and is uh, true also in those countries with more uh, accessible services. As we just said, the pandemic had a negative impact on the different aspects of uh, young people's lives. However, our findings also showed some positives. For example, 59% of young Europeans actually had an unexpected positive experience with working and studying from home. For this finding, uh, education and also income level uh, play an important role. In this, among those who had a positive experience, people from a, a wealthier income, as well as people from uh, with a higher educational level, all those more likely to have a positive experience. We also asked uh, young people what kind of um, impact the working and studying from home had on different aspects of their lives and we found that spending more time with family is the aspect that was most positively affected by working and studying from home followed by the ability of reducing a carbon footprint and then also adapting to new situations okay thank you um, i will talk a little bit about uh, political participation democracy and rule of law and what what we found in our survey on these topics the main point, which I already pointed out shortly before, is that a vast majority of young people think that they should be more empowered and more evolved uh, on the EU level at 67%. So that's a lot of them. That's also, I think, directly related to them needing better and more communications also by uh, political decision makers of how EU policy actually impacts their daily lives. Because 71% are calling for that. that that's a large number despite all the efforts being made uh, to communicate to, to citizens what the European Union is doing. And what's perhaps interesting to point out on both these questions is that there's quite a difference between countries within Europe, so in the Southwest, especially talking Italy, Spain, support is very high. They want to be more engaged. 
One outlier which we see throughout our study is Denmark, where only 43% of young people say we want to be more engaged. So there's, there's also large gaps within the European Union um, on, on this question. Um, another club theme we try to elaborate on is if young people are supporting that um, against the background of democratic backsliding, which we are unfortunately facing in some of our member states, if they're ready to also support sanctioning those member states, if they don't stick to the democratic principles, which the European Union and its treaties is setting out for itself. And indeed, we find that two thirds, 65 uh, percent is in favor of sanctioning those member states. And what's interesting here is that even in Hungary, country which we know is facing infringement procedures as we speak for not abiding to all of these um, principles, young people at 65%, so just in line with the average, are supporting the sanctioning, suggesting that, for example, in this country, young people seemingly are much more pro-European than the government might actually suggest. That's actually quite interesting. Um, another cluster of questions was looking more at how do young people actually engage politics? How do they participate? How do, how do they make their voice heard? And perhaps not so surprisingly, voting remains confirming what previous studies have found the most common way to, to engage in politics. 56% of our respondents have once in their life already participated in an election. Other um, strategies they prefer is um, donating money for a course at 36% have already done that and um, also pen, uh, petitioning in person on websites, 28% have, have done that. What's interesting here is, especially for those two things, donating money and petitioning, that young women seem to be much more in favor of using these kind of um, engagement strategies because they're about eight to 9% more likely than men to have petitioned or donated money. Um, some other um, strategies, how, how people engage is, for example, posting on social media at 20%, which seemingly actually quite quite low, Depend, looking at that we, we ask young, young people, then 18% have either demonstrated or boycotted. One interesting thing, maybe we looked also a little bit into the age differences, of course, and it seems like that those, the youngest of our respondents, so they were 16 and 17 in our sample, they seemingly are more following political organizations on social media, 7% more than those 18 or older, suggesting perhaps that especially the youngest of the youngest are more engaging in social media. That's, of course, also something interesting for decision makers of how to, how to reach um, different age groups. <clears throat> the following building block uh, talks about equality. The pandemic has def definitely brought up social economic issues to the fore. And throughout the whole report, it was clear that young people do care about the disadvantaged, and they also are worried about those who are left behind. One of the findings that highlight this general feeling of young people is the fact that tackling poverty and inequality is the second priority for the EU in the next five years. Moreover, among uh, all the different measures that have, be, have been taking place uh, in the past few years, the uh, number one that young people would like to keep also after the pandemic is uh, keeping the assistance for those most in need, with the 42% of our respondents voting for this. Moreover, we also looked at uh, um, the support for EU-led social economic policies. In this case, we found that 69% of our respondents want the EU to guarantee a um, minimum wage. And this is particularly important for those coming from a less stable financial situations. Moreover, 66% of our respondents think that the introduction of a universal basic income will be useful, while only 23% were against it. And moreover, also um, the EU ensuring a decent unemployment benefits uh, collected a high support with 58% of our respondents voting for it. However, even if uh, in general all of these uh, social economic uh, policies uh, collected a um, broad support, it is also true that there are some differences based on the country of different of uh, residents. For example, in Italy, Spain, and also Romania, people were more likely to support this kind of uh, um, social economic policies, while uh, less support was uh, collected in other countries, such as Denmark. Uh, as we just said, uh, um, e uh, equality is very important for young people. Therefore, they also would like to promote gender equality. In this case, we ask them, uh, what do you think among different actions would have the uh, most uh, impact to promote gender equality in Europe? And in this case, we found that reducing um, 
the gender pay gap, uh, meaning reducing the gaps in salaries and pensions between the men and women were the number one priority, followed by combating gender-based violence. And in the third position, we found the provide direct assistance to parents for childcare. In this case, it was interesting to see the differences between genders. Indeed, while women were more likely to uh, prioritize the reduction of gender-based, uh, um, of uh, reduction of uh, the um, gaps uh, to reduce the pay gaps, men were actually more likely to um, prioritize the combating gender-based violence. As we said, equality was uh, very important for uh, young people during the pandemic. However, also climate has been a hot topic also way before the onset of the pandemic. And the crisis definitely didn't change young people's mind. Instead, they still call for a greener and more sustainable Europe. In this case, we saw that uh, we found that combating climate change is the second most important priority for uh, spending the COVID-19 recovery package. However, even if young people do think it is very important uh, to um, combat climate change, they also think not enough uh, has been done and the EU is doing to combat, change, to combat climate change and to uh, protect the environment, with 65% uh, of our respondents uh, agreeing with this uh, statement. Moreover, as part of our um, data collection process, we also organized some focus groups. And in this focus group, uh, young people highlighted uh, climate change is a crisis and uh, we should uh, act uh, and um, treat it as one. Therefore, we should uh, um, act fast. And they also stressed uh, the idea that the 30 year time frame for achieving change is definitely too long and we need to act uh, faster. Again, uh, talking about climate change, we ask them, okay, climate change is important, but what do you think should be prioritized in terms of policies? In this case, uh, we found that making sure the fight against climate change is fair for all was the number one priority, and he shared the first position with also reducing pollution. In this case, uh, we can understand that from these findings that uh, see, they see fight, the fight against climate change as a fight for equality and they want sustainability efforts to be just for all. In the, the third position, we then find supply, uh, supply clean, affordable and secure energy. Another important findings was that 65% of Europeans want the EU to, to reduce energy and also energy dependence on outside sources. And these findings, findings and also view was probably reinforced by the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, that uh, is the perfect link to talking about Europe and the world and what young people think about how Europe should look in the world. Um, one of the main questions um, we ask is, do you want the European Union to speak more with a single voice um, also up to the outside world? And 52% uh, of our respondents believe that that is the case and only 34% thought that member states should do their own foreign policy only. Again, what we see here is interesting that there's again a large gap between men and women. Men are much more likely to want the EU to speak with a single voice at 57%, whereas women, young women only want that at 47%. That could, of course, suggest that um, women um, would have much more nationalistic sentiments, which would be a big surprise. It's not that. It's more that they often, and especially in this question as well, um, don't voice an opinion and choose the answer option of, I don't, I don't know. That is also something throughout the survey and which came, came through here especially. Another question we asked is if uh, young people want more uh, member states to join the European Union. Just about half have the opinion that uh, uh, there should be new uh, member states admitted soon. About a third, 33%, say, we already have enough member states and we should perhaps deepen first. And about 20% say, uh, I don't know, that the 49% might, me, might maybe not sound super enthusiastic, although it's of course the biggest group. But what we've also looked at is some previous surveys on subject, not on use only, but on the general po population. And actually it looks like that that could be an increase to previous surveys, which you cannot directly compare, but still it's a bigger number of, uh, than what we found in other surveys, which we uh, consulted. And another point which brings us close to the, the topic of Ukraine as well, we asked if uh, young Europeans were in favor of a European army, a single European army. 45% were for that in December to, uh, 2021. 
and 36 were against. And we see that in April, when we did our second wave of survey, that sentiment had actually not changed by a lot, suggesting that there is most of young people think that there should be a single European army, but that sentiment is also contradicted by quite a big group who say, maybe not. Um, which brings me to Ukraine, um, which is the survey we launched in, in April this year against the, the, the onset, well, two months after it, of the invasion of uh, Russia and Ukraine. And what we wanted to know is basically both are people worried about the conflict and, and, and its impact, and also what type of solidarity do they show actually with the people of Ukraine? And I think we found both. They're worried. Here expressed in over half of them, 55%, thinking that this conflict in the next five years might actually spread to their country. That's quite a large number. Thinking back 10, 15 years where war seemed unthinkable for most in most European countries, as a participant earlier had already pointed out. But what we also see, despite these worries, that there is a lot of solidarity. So 74% of young European people think that welcoming Ukraine refugees into their country is a crucial humanitarian measure which should be supported. We also see that 76% are in favor of maintaining the severe sanction, which are currently ongoing. 68 are in favor of sending more military aid to Ukraine. Um, we also saw that the support was actually strongest for, for all of these points, mostly in those countries which were very close to Ukraine's. Ukraine, its neighbors, Poland, Romania, which is maybe not a surprise because we um, put this survey in the field in April. So this is the kind of the peak of like the dynamically unfolding refugee situation and them, of course, having the most tangible experience also of the, con of the conflict in their own countries and also bordering the country where the war is ongoing. Um, the next chapter of our report is titled Building Back Better, and it looks at the future. Indeed, we asked our respondents, what would you like the EU to focus on in the next five years, both in general as well as focusing on social policy priorities? In this case, as also we mentioned before, young people are worried about jobs and employment, and it was the number one concern at the societal level. Indeed, also in this case, we find the jobs and employment in the first place as the first priority for the next five years. But however, um, jobs, just more jobs is not enough for young people. They also want a better quality. Indeed, improving the quality of jobs and salaries is the first priority when looking at the social policy priorities. This is followed then by promoting healthier living, healthcare, elderly care, and also housing. However, the whole issue about uh, quality of jobs uh, is particularly uh, key for millennials, with 44% of them voting for it, while it's less uh, crucial for uh, healthier respondents. Okay, so um, we also asked young people not only what you would like the EU to focus on in the next five years, but also how can we improve after the pandemic? What should we learn from the pandemic? In this case, we found that uh, a stronger focus on healthcare system is very important for them. However, the COVID-19 experience also underlined how crucial the cooperation between the 27 member states is. And that's why in the second and third um, priorities, we find a unified response to global threats and challenges. And they also think that sharing the cost of financial burden of a pandemic or future crisis is also important. Finally, uh, the EU um, launched a 800 billion euro emergency package, and we asked the young people, how do you think the EU should invest this money? Because uh, obviously this uh, package is very important, uh, is a very important opportunity for Europe to reinvent and transform and also to build back better. In this case, we found that, again, healthcare and social services is uh, the first area where uh, young people would like this money to be invested. And this could also be impacted by the fact that the uh, survey was uh, conducted between late uh, November and early December, so when we were still uh, in the middle of the pandemic. However, we also see that young people would like the money to be invested in uh, combating climate change, and finally also in a smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. Okay, so... Part of our, uh, the, one of the goal of our whole report was also to highlight and identify the similarities and differences in attitudes between millennials and Gen Z. 
throughout the whole report, we saw that they do have some uh, um, differences, but they are quite small. For example, millennials are slightly more concerned about jobs and income, while Gen Z will, are more concerned about physical and mental health and also their education. In this case, uh, the difference is probably due to an age difference because millennials are more likely to be already working and financially independent, while Gen Z might be still in education. Moreover, when we ask them about uh, um, their social policy priorities, we saw that Gen Z are 9% more likely than millennials to support uh, the promotion of the rights of the LGBTQI plus community as uh, one of their top uh, social policy priority. And finally, one of the differences that we found between millennials and Gen Z is the social media usage. As uh, we probably all know, in general, Gen Z use the social media more than millennials. In our uh, report, we also found that 10% of Gen Z, that Gen Z were 10% more likely to uh, use the social media as a coping mechanism during the um, pandemic. Which brings us already to the conclusions. Um, so these were, of course, a lot of information, a lot of facts. And if you're going to join us for the breakout groups, which we will hopefully will do, because we have a lot of interesting speakers, we'll contextualize also a lot of these many numbers. But what I want to do is here, like, what are kind of the, the main takeaways you may already now kind of try to remember from, from our report? So when it comes about concerns, it's really the main concerns on societal level is jobs and employment for young people. On the personal level, that switches much more to the health side and there, especially emotional and psych psychological well-being. And when it comes to remote work, actually most of uh, young people are in favor of keeping some degree of it. However, that comes with the caveat that those who are come maybe from more disadvantaged backgrounds, but also young women struggled more with it than perhaps the average respondent. Um, on the empowerment level, young people want to be more engaged. They want to be more empowered. That response was very clear in the data. Um, there also needs to be more communication, as, as I talked about, and that voting is the most important way on how, in how to, to participate in politics. Thirdly, solidarity featured very strongly across our building blocks, not only in the equality chapter, so the idea of really not leaving anyone behind and fighting inequalities came always to the fore. Example, young people, as was mentioned, want also the, the, the fight against climate change to be fair and just for all and to leave no one behind. And it's in, in fact the top priority among the, the, the climate um, policies they could choose of. And lastly, also reflecting a theme of um, solidarity is that they want to help uh, the people in Ukraine through multiple ways, like I said taking people and financial assistance. And when it comes to, to policy, um, what came out is that um, young people want more EU cooperation, especially when facing crisis. As was explained earlier already by our Secretary General, it's probably now the third crisis in a row. Now we are facing a cost of living crisis on top of everything we discussed. So I think we can take that finding also for the crisis, which is gonna come now, more cooperation is wished for. And then maybe last, that there is no wish to return to the old normal. So we've been talking about recovery, but we are not young people that want not to recover to the place where we want where before, but they want more access to health care. They want more focus on mental uh, health and better social services and decent jobs. And that's the end of it for now. <laughs> Thank you very much for that overview of the report. I'll remind you once more that copies of the report are available for you to read in depth at your leisure. Uh, just a small announcement now to say that we've reached the end of the live stream and we do hope that anyone who wants to will be able to come and join us in person for the rest of the afternoon.